Hi, this is Kendall Boyson, professional life and recovery coach, and you're listening to Encouragementology, the practice of instilling hope. Hi there. Thanks for joining me. On this show, we will be taking our time, revisiting the unbroken, and removing the quick and easy to prove it isn't always better. Convenience is, well, convenient, and progress is undeniable. But what would you go back to if you could? Have you early adopted yourself into technology overload? Do you feel more supported and connected or isolated and forgotten? Well, guess what? You can embrace or push back wherever and whenever you feel like it. Not impressed with the pace of this digital flume zoom? Then get off the ride. You choose. Already can't Already can't understand the one you have? Then stop upgrading. Missing a good old-fashioned henfest? Then stop texting and make a date with your friends. Put yourself back into the command center captain chair and start navigating this crazy high-speed world with a little more editing and veto power. I remember a day. Oh, here we go. Miles to school in the stow, one drumstick for the whole family, right? No, no. But let's all take a minute and remember a day. A really good day. Now, where are you and what's happening? Does your good day involve others or a much-needed day to yourself? Are you relaxing or living it up? Get specific and detailed, painting a vivid picture of this memory. Let's set aside this memory with the label of happy place as we visit the opposite, a very bad day. When was the last time you were frustrated, angry, defeated, anxious, overwhelmed? You fill in the blank. What are you doing and where are you? Are you with others or having a pity party by yourself? Are you solving the world's problems or on the verge of giving up? Give your memory some color and detail here. Now, how can we clone your happy place to visit it often while we minimize your days of frustration? The point is you have the power to direct your energy and your day. We're going to visit some ideas that you can use to navigate this busy and sometimes chaotic world to carve out more of the happy. Jisha Joseph found 25 people old enough to remember life before the internet share what they miss the most. This was found at scoop.upworthy.com. While the internet has made life incredibly easy for us in many respects, it's hard not to feel nostalgic about the simpler times when we aren't constantly connected to everything everywhere. Members of the Reddit community took a trip down memory lane about a year ago when a Reddit user posed this question on a forum. People old enough to remember life pre-internet, what are some less obvious things you miss about the time? Thousands of responses came in, with most expressing a wistful yearning for the old, good old days, for longer attention spans, and enjoying the simpler joys of life. So here are the top 25 answers. Not being accessible to my boss 14 hours a day. Leaving home and just being gone for the day. No cell phones. If there were cameras, it was really different. You used them to take pictures of things or had people take pictures of you. But there was no social media to preoccupy your mind. It was just doing something. And whoever you were with was who you were with. My formative years were the 1980s. I remember it like it was yesterday, going to study in Paris during my junior year of college. I got off the plane with no cell phone, no internet a Let's Go Paris book, and just a hostel address written on a piece of paper I'd stuck into a French dictionary. I didn't know a single person at all in France. I had $500 of cash stuck in a money belt. 
The belt was tight and sweaty, but the money had to last me for at least a month until I could find a part-time job with my lousy French. My credit card was my father's credit card written down on a piece of paper. He told me I could only use it to buy a plane ticket home in an emergency. I remember standing in the airport and having this powerful emotion of being 21 years old, scared out of my mind, but in absolutely complete control of my destiny. There was nobody who'd come rushing in to my aid if I needed it. I was 100% on my own. I'm actually very thankful for that experience. I found the hostel, I found a job, I made friends, I learned French. I made it all on my own, which was just a big boost in life confidence. I have no doubt if I had a cell phone, I would have called my parents on day two, told them it was too hard, and been on the next plane home. But I had no other choice but to succeed. Number four. I miss having an attention span for more than three seconds. News only being on at six. That was it. Now we have six hours of local news and 24 hours of cable news. Not being bombarded all day with news. And when you saw breaking news on the screen, you knew some serious stuff went down. Number six. Reading the newspaper and magazines used to be just about one of my favorite things. Now it seems pointless to clutter the house with so much paper that I can access online. But of course, I don't. I pick and choose just a few articles. I don't really browse the way I would before, and I encounter a lot fewer new and enlightening things. Getting the Sunday New York Times and then going out for brunch and reading it with my friends was such a treat. I used to get so excited when my favorite magazines came in the mail. I'd immediately sit down, leaf through them, and see what was worth reading right away and what could wait. Number seven, you had to call someone's house number and talk to their parents before you could talk to your friend. Video game cheat codes either spread by gaming magazines or by word of mouth. It used to be a lot harder to bail on things. You'd have to call the person at home and tell them yourself or at least leave a message if you wanted to be risky. Typically, if you were going to bail, you'd give at least 24 hours notice. Nowadays, people can let you know they're bailing last second since you're always reachable. Number nine, the ability to start over. I moved a lot. Every move, I could reinvent myself. Bookworm, punk, preppy. I got to try a lot of aspects of my personality and my past wasn't a factor. I also miss patience. I get annoyed at TV ads now. Radio makes you listen to the whole song. I'm far too comfortable with instant gratification. I miss the Sears catalog. That was how I found out about all the cool new toys. The Christmas wish book was the highlight of the year. Number 11. RSVPing mattered. If you said you were going to be there, you made sure you were there. None of this Facebook invites that everyone blows off without any form of social repercussions. If you said you were going to go and didn't go, you were the bad person and everyone knew it. Number 12. Sitting down in the evening to read a book because there was nothing on TV. With today's streaming services, there is so much more media being produced, and it's all available at the click of a button whenever you please. It can easily become an endless loop of whatever you want to watch next. I remember when there used to be eight channels. You either had to watch General Hospital or find something better to do. when you brought home new music and you just had to hope it was good. The single might be popular, but otherwise, unless someone had told you to buy it, you just hope for the best. Number 14, the instant win bottle caps, candy, chocolate bar wrappers, where you could turn them back into the store and immediately get a free one. Now it's just code you have to register on a website so they can get your info. I don't even bother anymore. Before the internet, facts were curated in the sense that information came from people with expert knowledge and was distributed by journalists or teachers who were held accountable for the accuracy of information. 
the internet has allowed crazy people to spout rubbish with hardly any filter. I miss my video game magazines. The thrill of getting one in the mail, often multiple because I had several different subscriptions to read up on, and the next thing coming out, strategies for games that recently came out, and just fun articles about related material were some of my favorite memories. Number 17, simplicity. I don't even know how to describe it. Like my days were filled with playing outside or swimming or reading in the treehouse for it. The Saturday morning cartoons and sitcoms. When you used to play outside and the only curfew you had was when it was starting to get dark. Number 20, the effort that people made to stay in touch. Now it's effortless, but people don't bother with anything but social media. 21, people would forget things you did that were maybe not the smartest. The absolute absence of push notifications. Life just waited for you like a good person. 23, you could be the cool guy that remembered, like who was in that movie or theme songs to TV shows. Now IMDb makes everyone that guy, and it's not special. There's a lot of little things like that. People just stopping by your house. You'd be just sitting there doing nothing and someone was at your door. And number 25, video rental stores. I have such good memories of going to our local Mr. Movie with my dad, renting a sci-fi flick and getting candy at the checkout. Streaming is cool and all, but I do miss video rental stores, mainly for nostalgic reasons. Oh my, I love these reminders of the 80s. You know they say you only know what you know, but I know that before technology, I felt like I had more time to wonder and dream, to let my mind run away with different ideas, to try to figure things out and come to my own conclusions, right or wrong. Maybe that's where rumors started and grew like wildfire. I also have memories of life being just a little bit slower. Maybe it's because we weren't staring at a clock all day. You might have one on your wrist or up on the wall, but now it's in the upper left hand or right hand corner of every page you look at. I know everyone says they remember when life was simpler about every generation, and maybe that has to do with life speeding up as we get older. We start at our life a little more simple pace and then speed up as we feel like this pressure of trying to accomplish all we want before a well-deserved break. I read a lot of history because it's so interesting to me to understand how people lived, what they accomplished, and how it shaped my life. So let's keep stepping in and out of the past. Bob Larkin shows us what it was like to live without today's technologies we totally take for granted. We had actual encyclopedias, people, instead of Wikipedia. This was found at bestlifeonline.com. It's hard to imagine life before technology, right? What if you had to get through a day without the internet? What about going on a road trip without Google Maps? Yikes. Or getting gifts in a pinch without Amazon? That all probably sounds nearly impossible these days. But not only did we do it a few decades ago, some of us even missed those simpler times. We managed to get just as much accomplished, but we just did it very differently. Today's modern conveniences are easy to take for granted, but it's important to look back on just how far we've come. There's a great saying that if we don't know where we come from, how can we know where we're going? Francine Cofolo, co-author of the new book, Tell It to the Future, says, I'm a firm believer that we learn from the past, and if we ignore things, we can't conceptualize because it seems too archaic or slow or unproductive, we miss understanding how we got to where we are today. So, in case you don't remember life before technology took over and made everything easier, Here's a glimpse of how different the world was in the 20th century. So, before GPS, 
guess what? We used atlases to get around. Anyone who took numerous road trips in the 20th century didn't have Google Maps handy. Instead, we had to take our atlases along for the ride. Spiral bound in just over 160 pages, these atlases contained highway and road information in all 50 states. But navigating from point A to B was still tricky. And because the atlases were only updated once a year, the information wasn't always correct. Peter Dalbus, 76, of Oak Park, Illinois, remembers being on the open road, guided only by his not-always-trusty Rand McNally Road Atlas. Sometimes there were missing roads, he said, or a road on the map that didn't technically exist. But we'd figure it out. You can't be complacent with an atlas, not like those people who put all their trust in a GPS. We never drove a car into a swamp because Rand McNally told us to, I'll tell you that much. If an atlas was ever lacking important travel information, Dalbus said he would pull into a visitor center. They'd know the exact change needed for the tolls and if there were any construction areas ahead. After a long day on the road, it could just be nice to hear another person's voice. Plus, they had maps. Free maps. Before email or texting, we wrote letters. If you wanted to send a message to someone without actually talking to them before the 2000s, you had to write them a letter. Yes, a letter by hand with paper and pen or pencil. And then you had to go to the nearest post office to buy stamps. The messages involved a little more effort and many people feel like it was a healthier way of communicating. Letters have always been a nice way to show someone when they're gone that you're thinking about them. This comes from Mike Stouffer of Wausau, Wisconsin. He told CNN referring to the notes he'd send to his wife Bobby in the early 1900s. They helped our relationship develop in a big way. Email can never replace the excitement and thrill of receiving and opening a personal letter. Before Wi-Fi, we used a phone line to connect to the internet. Long before Wi-Fi was a reality, the only way to go online was the dial-up internet access. Margaret Weiss, a life and financial coach in New Jersey, reminisced. You needed a regular landline, which would then come out of a wall socket and connect to your machine. You'd also need a monthly internet subscription, and in 1998, it would cost you $21.95 a month for an unlimited connection to AOL. Christopher Burke, a software developer from Seattle, wrote about the hassles of dial-up internet. If you have only one phone line, you have to make sure nobody else in the house picks up the phone to dial while you're connected to the internet, or your connection will drop and you'll have to dial in again, he recalled. Some cities had only one or two dial-up numbers, each connected to a switching system and a bank of maybe 10 to 100 modems. So during busy times of the day, you might not be able to connect to the internet at all because all the modems were in use by others. And everyone remembers the noise you heard as you dialed in. Before digital cameras, we'd wait a week for film to develop. Florida resident Barbara Lichenwalter's entry into photography was with a Bessler Topcon Automatic 100 film camera. The original user's manual is 60 pages long and contains detailed instructions on everything from shutter speed to depth of field distance charts to the 11-step process to load the camera. She said it took me weeks to learn how to take a decent photo. And with film, seeing what you photographed was anything but immediate. You mailed away the film or you took it to a film developer and you'd get it back in about a week. Then you'd see if you had anything in focus or the right colors. That said, even back in the day, you could still take a selfie of sorts as long as you were fast and your camera came equipped with a timer. You could prop the camera up and then run into the picture, take aim, and 
Hopefully you were actually in the photo. Before Venmo, we'd use cash or check to pay friends. Getting money to a friend or family member in the days before Venmo invariably required face-to-face -face contact. If you owed somebody 20 bucks, you had to get the physical currency either from an ATM or by walking into your bank's branch and requesting a withdrawal from one of the tellers. And then you had to bring the cash to the person you owed it to and hand it to them directly. Says Chad S. of Portland, Oregon. Or you could use a check. But that was, as Chad said, a whole thing. I paid a lot of debts by handing people a personal check. But it doesn't have the immediacy of cash. They have to bring that check to their bank, sign the back of it, and fill out a deposit form, and then wait up to three days, and sometimes much longer for the money to clear in their account. Things were considerably more difficult if you lived in a different city than the person you were trying to send money to. You could mail them a check, he said, or you could also mail them cash, which my grandparents sometimes did, but that was always dangerous. I remember my parents telling me, if you're going to mail cash, make sure it isn't visible through the envelope. So we'd wrap cash in paper or a greeting card or something to conceal it. And then again, there was the waiting involved. A letter could take several days to get to somebody, and sometimes a week. Before e-cigarettes, smoking was a very different experience. It wasn't too long ago that e-cigarettes and vaping didn't even exist, but things have changed so quickly, says Kevin Bryant, a Brit who quit smoking after 25 years. He reminisced about his favorite part of smoking cigarettes, the satisfaction of unwrapping a new pack. He went on, the crinkling of the surrounding wrap, the smell of fresh tobacco, the odor of adulthood, of choice, of freedom, of relaxation. Bryant also wrote about the context in which he smoked, indoors, which was largely allowed in major U.S. cities until 2000s. He recalled heading to a pub and getting a pint of warmish British beer, chatting about the serious and trivial in the smoking atmosphere with the jukebox blaring in the corner. Before iCloud storage, we printed out everything. Even when personal computers became the norm in the mid to late 1990s, we still didn't entirely trust technology to keep our files safe and secure. So if there was an important document you absolutely needed access to, you printed it out on paper. Arizona resident Tom Crossley recalled his father's office being taken up by filing cabinets. He added that his dad also had a walk-in safe, similar to the one you find in banks, and it was filled with more filing cabinets. The safe was not there because a theft worry, but because it was fireproof. Crossley's father employed the entire staff of filing clerks whose sole job was to retrieve files and update records to keep in those cabinets. Before Netflix, we had to leave our house to see a movie. Seeing the hottest new movie during the 20th century wasn't as easy as streaming it on your smartphone or adding it to your Netflix queue. You had to go to the theater. This comes from Adam Cole in Atlanta. If you didn't catch a film during its original run, you'd have to wait for it to air on TV in an edited form with commercial interruptions. That would take months or even years. For example, Star Wars, which was originally released on May 25, 1977, wasn't available for pay-per-view subscriptions until 1982, and it didn't come out to HBO until 1983. That's a six-year wait. Theater was really the only way to actually see a movie the way it was meant to be seen. I stood in line for two hours to get a ticket to Empire Strikes Back and then stood in another line for an hour and a half to get into the theater. Before DVRs, on-demand, or streaming services, guess what? We had to watch our favorite shows live. As recent at the mid 2000s. If you weren't available to watch your favorite TV show, you're just out of luck. There was no Hulu or on-demand services to catch it on the next day. Your only choice in the 80s or the 90s was to try to record the episode you knew you'd be missing on a VCR. 
But even that wasn't a surefire success. As one commentator explained on Metafilter, the VCR didn't have its own tuner and needed the cable box, and there was no communication between the devices. As a result, you would have to set the channel on the cable box and then the timer on the VCR. Mess either up, and guess what? You missed your show. Sorry. Anyone born before 1990 probably remembers that gut-wrenching feeling of 90210 not recording or learning your parents had taped over your favorite episode while trying to record NYPD Blue. Been there. Before tablets, we played car games all together. Keeping a kid entertained during a road trip involved a bit more creativity decades ago than just handing them a tablet. When I was younger, we would play number car games with our parents, said Illinois native Christopher. My father would think of a number between 1 and 100 and we would guess. He would say higher or lower until we got it right. When we took plane trips, we always brought books and a whole backpack full of coloring books, crayons, and colored pencils. It was so much fun to be creative. Each of us would try to demonstrate we were the best at coloring. Then we'd draw pictures of each other, which usually resulted in a lot of laughs and someone getting upset. The short of it is, kids had to entertain themselves. Laura Warfill from Chicago said, I remember spending all of my time looking out the large windows of our car to see what I could see. If we happened to be driving at night, I would boost myself up so that I could look at the moon and the stars. Before Kindles, we had to go to the library. There was also no reading during a car or plane trip unless you remembered to pack a physical book. And if you didn't own one, you had to head to the library. Books came in all sizes, and you could borrow them from the library. By finding that perfect book required an understanding of how they were arranged in the library. Library books were arranged by the Dewey Decimal System, a system of numbering to put books in their respective genre. Chris Coleman, a library based in Thousand Oaks, California, provided the following explanation. For every single piece in the collection... A paper card is typed up with the item's information. For a patron to locate any item, they looked at the file and sorted through the cards. When a patron finds a card matching the selection they want, they can use it to locate the item in the collection. Then bring both with the card and the item to the circulation desk, where they take the card and place it in a dated file, inserted a due date, and return the item to the patron. Clearly, the Kindle was just the stuff of science fiction in those days. Before fitness trackers, we never thought about our heart rates. Tracking your fitness in the 20th century was far less precise than we've become accustomed to today. The only time I ever tracked my fitness was at the gym. This comes from New Yorker Ron S. That's the only time I even wondered how many steps I was taking or anything like that. And my heart rate? Gosh, I didn't even think about it. That's something your doctor checked during an annual exam. It's not something you monitored every day. That would have been crazy of us. Most people back then weren't as dedicated to exercise. It was a weight loss tool rather than healthy living. There were private gyms that you could belong to and use their equipment like Jack LaLanne or Vic Tanny's, or you could buy a small set of dumbbells for home use. But walking and home exercise were for health nuts and bodybuilders. Before Skype and WhatsApp, we cared about the cost of long-distance phone calls. Phone call fees were often based on distance. The closer you lived to the person you were contacting, the cheaper the call. The first minute was always the most expensive. Comes from one blogger who said long distance rates were so steep that you could fill up your tank with gas for the price of talking on the phone for an hour. The other factor was the time of day. Calls were cheaper on weekends and late at night. In most homes, long distance was forbidden except on weekends. If you absolutely had to call on a weekday, it would have to be late in the evening when the rates were down. Before e-ticketing, We had to buy event tickets at a box office or through a lottery system. 
Today, we all know how frustrating it can be to wait for your digital spot in line when tickets go on sale for your favorite artist tour. But just a few decades ago, it was an entirely different experience. You had to go into an actual retailer like a record store or a venue's box office to get tickets. Scott Hudson, a music critic in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, wrote about desperately wanting to see Bruce Springsteen in the 1980s in Lincoln, Nebraska. The day before tickets went on sale, a buddy and I made the four-hour journey and discovered when we were approximately number 1,800 in line. The box office opened at 10 a.m., and even with the 10 or so clerks selling tickets, they still didn't make it to the front of the line until around 6 p.m. That's because you'd point to a spot on the venue floor and the clerks would go see if there were any tickets left in that section. You repeat this process until you found open seats. Before Wikipedia, we'd invest in a set of encyclopedias. Yes, folks, people visiting door-to-door -door selling books. Any family in the 20th century that wanted round-the-clock access to tons of information couldn't simply hop on the internet. As an Orlando Sentinel reporter explained in the late 80s, families would invest in a huge set of encyclopedias that were hardback volumes with gold-lettered bindings and pseudo-Greek titles. And they weren't cheap. The price ranged between $300 to $1,500. There were even door-to-door -door salesmen who used high-pressured sales tactics to hawk costly encyclopedias. I love being part of a generation that remembers before there was this or that. What about you? What do you remember about a simpler life? Matt and I try to imagine what's next, the next big thing of the past. Let's see if we can predict it. What do you think it is? Will we be saying, Facebook, why would anyone want to invest all their time in chronicling their life for the world to see? And who cares anymore? What about selfie, really? A picture of yourself that you took on purpose? <laughs> can you only imagine what they will say about us? Life can be as simple as you please. If you don't believe me, let's find out. Sophie at Malama life.com reminds us the core message of my slow living and minimalist content is to encourage others to live life more intentionally by slowing down and paying attention to the simple joys of life. The morning cup of coffee, a long walk in nature, a cold shower on a hot summer day. By placing a greater emphasis on these small moments that are often overlooked, I believe we can go through life with a deeper sense of gratitude and fulfillment. Instead of chasing happiness, we can live it. Here she shares seven tiny ways to simplify your life found on her YouTube channel. Let's take a listen. I live in a small fishing village in Portugal. Life is simpler here. And that's one of the biggest reasons why we chose this place to be our new home. I wanted to disconnect from the hectic and complicated modern world and find my way back to what's truly important to me. To me, this means enjoying fresh quality ingredients, spending time with my husband, being close to the natural beauty, and having sufficient time in my day for myself to do whatever I want. These are the factors that affect the quality of my life and there's not much else. I found that when I started to cut back the noise and the excess in all areas of my life, it was easy to focus on building a life with those priorities in mind. I am truly grateful to be here to observe and take in what it really means to live a simple life. But I also think that these lifestyle values and habits can be applied to all of our lives, no matter where we are in the world. So if you're also looking to simplify your life, here are some tiny habits and tips to get you started. Our 
our bedroom has enough space to fit a bed, a nightstand, and that's about it. It felt a little bit empty at first, but now I really appreciate having a simple, clutter-free bedroom. Every morning when I wake up, I pull back the curtains and I open the windows to let the light shine through. The room looks into a little courtyard with all of my beautiful adopted plants, and I love that this is the first thing I see in the morning. If you are trying to simplify your life, I highly encourage you to re-examine your physical space first, starting with your bedroom. Look around and see if there are unnecessary decor on your nightstand, big clunky furniture that's just not being used, or tangled electric cords and tech stuff everywhere. These things might be getting in the way of achieving a peaceful and calming atmosphere. I am proud to say that I no longer have clothes in my wardrobe that I do not wear, which might sound a little bit ridiculous because that should be the norm, but unfortunately, it wasn't for me. When I decluttered my entire closet before the big move, I only chose to keep the items that I knew that I would wear over and over again in Portugal. Thankfully, the climate and lifestyle here is quite similar to Maui, so I was able to keep most of my clothes and feel that I don't need to add any more pieces for the foreseeable future. Having a smart capsule wardrobe really eliminates the question of what should I wear today? Because every piece should be interchangeable to complement each other and work with your specific lifestyle. It eliminates the need to impulse buy random pieces of clothing because you already have a wardrobe of carefully selected pieces that you love. It makes getting ready in the morning so easy and it saves us a lot of money too. So look in your closet and your makeup drawer, your jewelry box, and ask yourself if all the pieces are a good reflection of you and your style. My job requires me to be on a computer all throughout the day. So whenever I can, I try to steer away from technology and other areas of my life. Instead of depending on my phone for entertainment, I go for walks or work on my creative hobbies. Instead of always consuming content, I try to enjoy the quiet house or tune into whatever is happening around me. Instead of depending on my GPS, I try to look for landmarks to navigate. It's not to make my life more difficult on purpose, but it's because I don't want to be so dependent on technology that I eventually forget how to socialize, memorize, have fun, or just know what life is like without these devices. Technology can actually simplify our lives in many aspects, but it can also completely take over if we depend on it for every little thing. So to find that balance, maybe try eliminating some apps on your phone, complete your chores the old-fashioned way, or simply leave your phone at home when you're going out for dinner. The more we steer away from technology, the more that we're left with just the raw ingredients of life. Instead of getting a gym membership, joining classes or yoga meetups, I find that the most sustainable way of being active and exercising is to make it a part of my lifestyle. It costs nothing and barely takes any effort. Lately, we have been walking a lot. We walk 40 minutes round trip to the supermarket, another hour to walk with our dogs. Almost every day, we climb up the steep hills to go film and take photos and explore. Maybe this is not enough if you're trying to sculpt your body a certain way or if you're trying to get ready for a marathon, but it's enough for me and my body. I realized a long time ago that I won't be consistent if physical activity feels like a chore. So I always try to make it fun, adventurous, and purposeful. One of the biggest habits I left behind was the habit of online shopping. I truly think that the convenience of online shopping 
is both a blessing and a curse on our society. Of course, I can see why this is useful for people who don't have quick access to things they need or anyone who's not able to easily go to the stores. But this wasn't my case. I used it as a way to get that instant gratification. Whenever I felt like I needed something, I would put it in my cart, and it was just one click away from appearing at my doorsteps. Now if I need something, I walk to the store. When I'm checking out, I can look at my cart and take another second to think if I really need the item. And sometimes I change my mind on the way to the store. Besides, it stops me from just browsing at other items or getting bombarded with ads online. My husband and I love to eat out at least once a week. Especially since moving to Portugal, we've been loving trying all the different food, flavors, and love getting to know our local restaurants too. But for the other 99% of the time, I cook at home, and I try to rely on these easy go-to meals that I can prepare in less than 20 minutes. In the past, we would always contemplate on what to eat, and when we couldn't make a decision, we would always default to getting takeout or a snack on whatever was laying around the house which wasn't a good habit, and I feel like it could have been easily avoided if we had this library of simple meals that we both love. So whenever I come across a recipe that I want to try, I save it in a folder on my Instagram or on my email, and I'll look through it when I'm looking for ideas or when I'm planning out my meals to go grocery shopping. I always mention how much I love meal prepping, but I know that not everyone is a fan of eating the same thing every day. So if you fall into that category, try ingredients prepping instead, where you chop, prep, and store your ingredients for the week right after you come back from the market. Then you have everything ready and available to you whenever you're ready to cook. I'm always thinking of ways to simplify my admin life, my responsibilities, bills, and tasks. I've tried using so many different apps and methods, but for me, nothing has been as effective as my Google Calendar, my little black notebook, and my notes app for my phone. On my calendar, I block off special dates, set reminders for bills and appointments, mark special dates or dates I need to keep track of. In my notebook, I write down my passwords, my to-do list, my shopping list, and in my notes app, I jot down video ideas, movies and books I want to read, and just good quotes that I come across. Call me old school, but this method just works for me. If you feel like your life is disorganized and hectic, simplify your system to one that works for you. It doesn't have to be a fancy, expensive app, but just a method you know that you'll be consistent with. A simple life is a beautiful life. One that's been intentionally crafted to have so much meaning, depth, and joy. I hope that you're able to apply some of these tiny habits to your life as well. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll talk to you soon. If you want to share Encouragementology with a friend who needs to know they're not alone in this journey of self-discovery, you can visit Encouragementology.com or anywhere you stream your content to receive this episode and all others. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram for additional encouragement throughout the week. So I challenge you, before you jump to adopt the new and improved, evaluate its relevance for you and your life. Protect what's important, even if it's simpler. Recreate your happy place with meaningful moments. I know you can do it. Thank you for listening to Encouragementology with Kendall Boyson, where we find positive ways to handle some of life's challenges. I stumbled through until the path was clear. That's when I found you. How I want.